Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? <clears throat> Early morning for me. I've been up for a couple hours already. I don't know why I woke up. But we'll go ahead and do a video. Um, I may do a video later. I got to go and look a couple things up. Um, I may do a video later today about, if the Lord wills, about all the, um, all the, I say hoopla, all the drama about this coming eclipse on April 8th. There's a lot of people really jumping on the bandwagon of something major happening, but it never, it doesn't seem like anybody can actually pin anything down. And so I did a video about along those lines, not this particular event, but what the significance that people are attributing to this event are uh, a while back. I'm going to see if I can find that video and then that way I can reference it and link it. Uh, to you guys, but um, I think people may be reading more into this than what's really there. It, it, it certainly is a sign. All this stuff shows something's going on, especially since in the last seven years, this will be now the second total eclipse over America. But I think they're reading a little bit more into what's actually there versus what the Bible actually says is going to happen. Uh, and the timing is way off. So we'll see. Um, I'm going I'm to try to see if I can put it together because i got a bunch of appointments coming up the next, I think, three, four days. So uh, this may be my only chance to do this. But we'll see what the Lord Lord, Lord leads to do. Um, and if I do, it'll be up at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, I'll put a thing on the community tab if I'm actually able to do the video, uh, giving everybody a heads up. So this morning we're going to be reading out of Luke 22, 48. Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? The whole verse says, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Let's go up here. So we were here just recently in the upper part of Luke. Well, it's still the lower part of Luke 22, where the Lord was asking about taking the cup away. And he was talking about the guys that were sleeping. And so we'll jump right here into verse 47, which starts the context of this particular instance. Betrayal and arrest of Jesus. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who called, who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, we shall strike with the sword, or shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour in the power of darkness. And then he gets arrested and talks to Peter. Very interesting interaction going on there. But this is our context right here being betrayed by a kiss. And in Proverbs, we read a verse where it says, the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. And I find an interesting connection between that proverb and this event right here. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The wounds of, the friend, of a friend are faithful. Let me be on my guard when the world puts on a loving face, for it will, if possible, betray me as it did my master, with a kiss. The feigned love of the people around you, those who say they're your friends, those who say they love you, your fam, your supposed family, um, they will say whatever they can to gain advantage. And they will tell you they love you and they will, you know, curse you with a kiss. They, they will betray you with the nicest words. Like I, I've used the analogy before, an analogy I made up. Satan, if you want to picture what he looks like, he's a very handsome man, a good-looking man in a nice suit with a really white, pretty smile. And he talks very, he's a car salesman, talks very smooth words. And he escorts you right through the gates of hell with his arm around your shoulder. And you never realize it. Pretty much a charismatic pr preacher. <laughs> picture Joel Osteen. So, I mean, literally, so 
they'll tell you these nice things and tell you what they think you want to hear to gain an advantage over you, to get some kind of, of, of advantage that benefits them and they will use you. And I've since learned this um, about a great many people in my life. That's why I don't hang out with hardly anybody. That's why I don't hardly have any friends. Because I found out that most of the people I knew were out to get something, were out to get an advantage over me. And so you have to be on guard for that. And if you don't know what to look for, it's hard to do that. Uh, but it can make you very s- cynical having to endure that. But what I've realized, and especially now it's really bad, what I've realized is that the majority of people in our lives, that's exactly what they're doing. They, In some cases, they may not even realize that's what they're doing, but that's what they're doing. Whenever a man, they use love as a weapon. Whenever a man is about to stab religion, he usually professes a very great reverence for it. Let me beware of the sleek-faced hypocrisy, which is armor, which is armor bearer to heresy and infidelity. Knowing the deceivableness of unrighteousness, let me be wise as a serpent to detect and avoid the designs of the enemy. The young man, void of understanding, and that was me. That was me most of my life. Was led astray by the kiss of a strange woman. May my soul be so graciously instructed all this day that. The much fair speech of the world may have no effect upon me. Holy Spirit, let me not, a poor, frail son of man, be betrayed by a kiss. But what if I should be guilty of the same accursed sin as Judas, the son of perdition? And this is an interesting question. Like I I said, there are some people that do not realize they do this. I have been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. I am a member of his visible church. I sit at the communion table. All these are so many kisses of my lips. Am I sincere in them? If not, I am a base traitor. Do I live in the world as carelessly as others do, and yet make a profession of being a follower of Jesus? Do I live a life that glorifies him? Then I must expose religion to ridicule and lead men to speak evil of the holy name by which I am called. Surely, if I act thus inconsistently, I am a Judas, and it were better for me that I had never been born. Dare I hope that I am clear in this matter? Anybody remember that passage in Hebrews that talks about that? Yeah. That would be the majority of what is called Christianity today, unfortunately. And a lot of people don't like to hear that, but that's the case. Jesus made it clear. Many there are that find the road to destruction, and few there are that find the road to eternal life. Then, O Lord, keep me so. Dare I hope that I am clear in this matter? Then, O Lord, keep me so. O Lord, make me sincere and true. Preserve me from every false way. Never let me betray my Savior. I do love thee, Jesus, and though I often grieve thee, yet I would desire to abide faithful even unto death. O God, forgive that I should be a high-soaring professor and then fall at last into the lake of fire because I betrayed my master with a kiss. This goes back to, actually goes back to the Ten Commandments. When God said, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. A lot of people think that's using his name as a cuss word. Well, obviously we don't want to use his name as a cuss word, which most people do. Anytime they see something crazy or hear something crazy or hurt themselves in a small way, they immediately want to shout the name of Jesus Christ out using it as a cuss word. That's not what that commandment is talking about. It's much more deep than that. That commandment is talking about don't claim you're something you're not. Don't claim you're a believer and a follower of God or a child of God when you are not. That's taking the Lord's name in vain because you are taking the Lord's name upon yourself and claiming you are his when you're not his. Big difference from what we were we were taught. It's not a superficial commandment. This is a very personal commandment. All of them are. Just like honoring your mother and father. Do you know how you really honor your mother and father? It isn't 
letting them dictate to you, even if they're wrong, how you should live your life and never saying a cross word back to them. It's being the kind of, of adult that reflects greatly upon them. That when somebody sees you, they'll say, that guy or that woman was raised by good parents. You bring honor to their name by your conduct in your adult life. That's honoring your mother and father. Taking the things they taught you and growing in those and adding to them. Raising up your children the right way. That's that's honoring your mother and father. The, the, the way we've been taught superficially to look at the commandments is ridiculous. But that's not what it says. Go read them for yourselves and you'll understand. Ask the Lord. He'll show it to you. And so we can look much deeper into what's going on here. That we have a lot of superficial believers. They're false professors. They think they're Christians. They claim to be Christians, yet they have no real understanding of what they believe in or who. <laughs> and everything that they do and they say and, and their actions and everything are all superficial. They're tailored to bring a desired result. And it, oh, it will only be too late when many, or only too late, many will suddenly realize what they've done. And very well may not find room for repentance because the Lord may not allow it. Because more damage has been done by false professors than unbelievers to the church. See, an unbeliever has no part to play in the church. An unbeliever exists outside of the church. It is the people within the church that bring it down. So it is the false professor that has done the damage. It is the people who look, act, talk, walk, and for all intents and purposes, by all outward appearances, portray themselves as Christians. They're the ones that have done the damage. They're the ones that have brought us down to the level that we're at. Not the unbeliever. The unbeliever could care less. The enemy is within. And so there are a great many people today who betray Jesus with a kiss. They betray us with a kiss. Oh, I love you. You're my brother or sister in Christ. But then they talk bad about you behind their back. Or go and talk to other people who have some authority or say so to get you kicked out of the church. Or to make things harder on you. Or because if they have an they have a, a upper position in the church, use that to try to weasel their way into situations or wheel you out from situations. I experienced this personally in my last church. It's just one of the reasons why I left. And these people are the biggest hypocrites there are. But see, people don't want to hear about that. A lot of people that started watching this video probably already clicked away because they don't want to hear about that. It, the thing is, it's the truth. And it's important that we know this and can identify this stuff. Because if we can't learn how to identify it as much as we don't want to admit it or don't want to see it, if we can't learn to identify it, then we'll never know if we start doing it. Way, way back. Back when cars were much simpler. Everything came out with power steering and all these new things were coming up, you know, uh, vacuum assisted brake boosters. You know, I've driven cars without all that stuff. And people didn't know that if you spun the wheel all the way one way or the other, you'd hear that power steering pump go start to whine because you had locked the steering all the way over and it was straining the system. And it would, it would build up too much pressure. It would blow the high pressure hose. It would ruin the pumps. This was back before the, the stops, because now all suspensions have stops now. Don't let you turn it that far. You can't. You can only. You can only turn it till it stops, and then it won't go any further, so it doesn't strain the system. But back then they didn't have that because they didn't realize that. I've seen these pumps blow before, so people didn't know. If no one ever told them, they would never know. If no one ever explained to them that, they would never know. 
It is only when somebody explains to them and shows them that they learn that and know what to recognize. You hear that whine, you back off a little bit. And that's what I would tell people. Hey, don't lock your steering on your car. You're, you're going to blow your pump. So when you hear that, I told them, when you hear that noise, back up just a touch. Then you know you're good. Now all the vehicles have stops on them. You can look under the suspension and see the stop that keeps it from turning too far. You can't turn it any further unless you cut the stop off. But if people don't know, they don't know what to recognize. It's just like we have this little snake. We call it a Chinese rat snake. And it's just, it's a, it's a rat snake. It's harmless. They get rather big though. As soon as people see them immediately, they go rattlesnake. That's not a rattlesnake. How can you tell? Well, look at the skin. It's smooth skin. Yeah, but the pattern. It's a smooth skin. Rattlesnakes are pit vipers. Pit vipers have raised scales and they're very defined. These little Chinese rat snakes are very smooth. You can't hardly see the scales on them. Big difference. But right away they see that and they're like, that's a rattlesnake. That's not a rattlesnake. And, and they'll argue with you and it's okay, where's the rattle? No, but look, it's tails black, but where's the rattle? All rattlesnakes have a rattle, unless it's been broken off or torn off. There's no rattle. It's not a rattlesnake. Real simple. You can tell by the shape of the head. The Chinese rat snakes have a long, narrow head, where rattlesnakes have a short, wide head. Big difference. You can tell by the eyes. Chinese rat snakes have round pupils. Rattlesnakes have cat eyes. Big difference. But if nobody ever learns the difference, like king snakes, or not king snakes, um, coral snakes, and... Uh, the, I guess the milk snake or the, the false coral snake. There's a harmless one and there's another one that's very poisonous. If you don't know the difference, if nobody ever teaches you what to watch for, then you don't know. You either walk up and pick up a poisonous one or you run away from a non-poisonous one. And the way you tell is simple. There's, there's a, a saying for it. Red on black, friend of Jack. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. So if the red stripe is touching black, you're good. If it's touching yellow, you're not good. But if nobody ever teaches anybody these things, you'll never know what to watch for. How do you identify a cotton mouse snake? People call them by two different names, but how do you identify it? They got white lips on their face. They're around their mouth, it's white, that's a cotton mouth. Their belly is very white, but their back is very gray. That's how you tell the difference. That's how you know you gotta stay away from it because cotton mouths are very poisonous. But if you, nobody knows and nobody teaches you, if you don't know what to watch for, if you don't know what to identify, like when you're driving down the road, car starts to run funny, nobody knows what to do. I see people do it all the time. They blast down the highway. Car starts to run funny. They don't they don't they don't know they don't know what's going on. They just think it's the road. They run their car. And you can see when you drive down Texas highways, these big black marks on the side of the road up by the retaining walls. That's from cars that caught fire because people ran them until they overheated. But they don't know what to watch for. Nobody teaches anybody anymore. So if we don't know what to look for, because we're not willing to face the facts, how are we ever going to know if we're doing it? How are we ever going to know if, if we're the ones joining in and causing more of the problem? And so we have to face the facts. We have to face the reality of things. So it's really important that we look at what the Bible says about these things, even the negative stuff, and pay attention to it and listen to it and identify these characteristics, identify what this looks like so that if at the, if at the very least we can look at our own behavior and our self-examinations, which we should be doing, and see whether or not we're doing that. And if we are, change it. Because when we learn how to look for it within ourselves, we're able to identify it in others. Could that have helped Judas? I don't know. I, I would imagine Judas was a thief to begin with. He just saw a greater opportunity because they gave him the, the bag of money to carry around for the whole group. And so he took advantage of it. Who, who knows? But I found it interesting that the rest of the apostles didn't even know. They didn't know until this moment. They didn't know until this happened because they weren't aware of what was going on. Even when they were sitting at dinner, the one who dips his hand in the bowl with me tonight is the one that's going to betray me. The rest of the apostles asked, asked themselves, is it me? And they asked each other, is it me? Not even realizing that it was Judas. And he literally did it right in front of them. They didn't know what to look for. They didn't know what to watch for. 
Now, luckily, it was amazing because in their humility, they asked first, is it me? Am I the one that's going to do this? But if they didn't know what to look for, which I think was by design that they didn't, they would have avoided a lot of the things that happened because of Judas. But I think it was by design that they didn't know it because all those things had to happen. But how interesting that we can learn from that lesson. We can learn from this event and know what to watch for, what to be careful of. And so like the devotion was talking about, we need to be careful that we are not showing people love that is deceitful love. Love to gain a position, to gain a, a foothold in their lives, to take advantage of them, to put us in a position where we can go and we can utilize them to satisfy our desires. Basically, what I, the way I, I've learned, the way I've perceived it, is that there are people on this earth that think they run the show, and there are other people on this earth that they think were put on this earth to serve them. I've realized in the last seven years, especially the last five years while I've been doing this, that that's a whole lot of people. They have a mentality that they think that there are certain people on this earth that were put on this earth, earth to serve them, for them to utilize and to use and to abuse. It's an extreme narcissism called megalomania. And there's a lot of them out there, a shockingly high number of them. But they really believe that this person was put on the earth to serve me. That person was put on the earth to serve me. If you're not one of us in our group, you're the servants. And it's only just in the last few years that I've really discovered this because I was on the receiving end of all that. And I've now realized what the case is. And now I'm much more observant. There are times now where I let people do it so they expose themselves. They don't know that I'm doing it until I tell them what's going on. But I've learned to watch for those things. And I've also learned by learning those details and learning what to watch for, I learned to make sure that I'm not doing it. To make sure that I examine myself and identify whether I'm doing it or not. In this same scenario, we can do the same thing. If I know what to watch for, not only can I make sure I'm not doing it, but I can see it in other people and know what to avoid. And I tell you what, it would shock you to find out who, even those amongst those closest to you, are doing this very same thing. And so we would all do well to examine ourselves, to identify whether or not this exists within each of us. And when we learn to do that and face the facts of it, we can identify it in others. The key thing, because whether they use us or not is irrelevant. The Lord is going to take care of all that stuff anyway. And this life is short, so it's only for a short time. But if we can make sure we can identify it in ourselves, we can make sure we're not one of those that's doing that. And that's what the, the point of the devotion was. Let me make sure that I'm not doing that. And if I am, Lord, change me. Lord, change that. Fix me so that I don't do that. I don't want to betray you with a kiss. I don't want to say I love you, but I'm holding a knife behind my back. I don't want to, to expect something because I say the right words. I have somebody living in my house that does that very thing. She's receiving the reward for her actions without me doing anything. But it would shock you because it shocked me to realize how many people are really like this. May we not be those people May we not be those people that say we love somebody, but really we despise them. May we not be those people that claim or feign or fake or you know put on this facade or this show that we care about somebody when we really don't. May we not be those people. May our love be genuine and true like Jesus Christ's love is. So that not only do we keep from betraying each other, but that we keep from betraying him. Because when we betray each other, there is forgiveness, but if we betray him, I don't want to be on that side of that. I don't want to be on the receiving end of what may come from that. 
because there's a lot of warnings in the Bible for Christians. In fact, all the warnings are for Christians. The unbeliever, you need to get saved. The believer, you make sure you know where you're walking. And there's warning after warning. Don't do that stuff. Because a lot of people come in the door and immediately walk back out or come in the door and keep their foot in the door to keep it open a crack so they can escape because they're not 100% sold on Christ. They're not fully in. They're not saved. They have a knowledge of it. They've grasped it, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. They never come to that place where they are fully converted, where they are fully changed, where they are for Christ. And so they do what they have to do and say what they have to say to get what they want. I heard somebody a bunch of years ago say that, that the worst thing in hell, a lot of people talk about all these things in hell. They said the worst thing in hell is that everybody's a narcissist in hell. In the most extreme circumstance, all looking out for number one themselves. And the more I learned to identify it, the more I see it in so many people. And in a lot of cases, it's very passive, but it's there. There's a passive narcissist. There's a megalomania nar narcissist. And, it, and it just, it shocks, it still shocks me. Even though I, I'm learning what to watch for, it still shocks me. And it, told, it shows me not to be that kind of person. It shows me, watch out for these characteristics. If they, you see them in you, change it. Because the Lord doesn't want us to pretend. He doesn't want us to fake. Because this is real. And what's going to happen is real. And it's going to happen exactly the way the Bible says it is. You want to know who, you want to, you want to be able to identify a narcissist? Find somebody who takes something negative in the Bible and changes it because they don't like it. That's a narcissist. That's these people betraying the son of man with a kiss. Well, I don't really like that. So, well, or like, what's, what's his name? It just everybody thought he was a big Christian and he's like, well, I have issues with Jesus. Really? Betraying the son of man with a kiss. Well, I love you, Lord, but no buts. You're either in or out. You're either sold on Christ or you're uh, still attached to the world. And unfortunately for a great majority of people, the 99% They're looking out for themselves and no one else. Their love is a fake love. They'll tell you that, oh, you're so nice. You're so wonderful. I love you to death. And it's fake. And, and I, I think back in my life and I, I see all these images in my head of all these interactions I've seen. And I'm standing there looking at it. That's just the fakest, the fakest expression I've ever seen. Someone saying they love somebody and it was fake. It's all fake. And they do it more and more to make sure they keep things the way they want them. If they'll do it to us, they'll do it to him. If they've done it to him, they most certainly will do it to us. Praise God that even after everything kicks off, he's still going to leave the door open for people to be saved. But it's going to be much different than in the age of grace. This age of grace is about to end. It's going to be a much different way after that. It's going to cost them a great deal. I don't want to be on that side of it. I want to be on this side of it. I want to be on the Lord's side of it. I don't want to betray him with a kiss because I'm trying to gain some kind of advantage. Like, like he doesn't know. And they really believe, and this is what blew me away. And I found this out by conversations and by research. They really think he doesn't know. They really think he doesn't realize. They really think you don't know. They, t they convince themselves that you don't know, even if you tell them you know. I've done it done it stood right there face to face with the person and told them right to their face and they still don't believe that I know and they think they know God how is that possible if they can't even see what's going on right in front of them the Lord said he would blind 
all the earth dwellers. They're going to be blinded. They're not going to be able to see. He's going to stop their ears up. They're not going to be able to hear. They don't want the truth. And it's only us who are called by his name that want the truth that he's going to show it to. So let's, let us make sure where we stand. He's worthy of that attention. And let us go to him and ask him, Lord, show me where I'm standing so that I don't betray you. I don't want to betray you. And he will do that. Because he loves us that much. To never leave us and never abandon us. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. Father, there's times where I hate knowing what I know and I hate learning what I've learned. Because not knowing those things in some cases was better. Because ignorance is bliss. But in a lot of cases, now that I know, it's better because now I'm not being taken advantage of. And I've also learned what to identify, how to identify that and make sure that that's not present in me. And I'm not perfect at it, but it's a whole lot better than what it was. But Father, when did we get so far off track? When did we, when did we skip the line? When did we try to buy our way in? Not only in our individual interactions and stuff, or, you know, in, in everyday life, but try to buy our way into heaven. And, and it's funny because your scriptures tell us that's exactly what people are going to try to do. Come in by any other way. And this is what we see people doing, this fake love, this, this fake concern. And we see it in people calling themselves Christians every day where they'll curse us out with the, the most vile sl slurs. But then say, I say this because I love you. I am your brother or sister in Christ. God, I got it, got it. It's all diatribe. And they think that that's okay. They think that that, that means that, that settles the issue and it doesn't. And Lord, you have taken me down a, a really weird winding road that has shown me a lot of these things, not only about myself, but about others. And, and you've changed those things in me. And I pray you continue to do that in all of us who are called by your name. But Lord, help us identify it, not only for ourselves to make sure we're not betraying you, but to identify it in others so that we're not betrayed, so that we know what to avoid, that we know what to watch for, so that we're careful not to get ourselves trapped in something. Because like Proverbs says, um, the wise see trouble coming and hide themselves and the foolish walk on and are punished. And so we don't want to be like that. We, don't, we, want, to, we want to not act like what the world is doing towards you. But we also don't want to be a part of that and get ourselves pulled into it inadvertently because we're not paying attention or we don't know what to watch for. But most importantly, may we guard our hearts and may you guard our hearts so that we don't end up doing that to you. I don't want to betray you with a kiss. I don't want to say I love you and it be fake. I don't want to pretend to be something I'm not, thereby violating your, the very commandment that says not to do it. So I want to be genuine in all things. Lord, may your mercy be showered upon us and your grace. And may you show us all, teach us all, secure us all where we should stand. To stand where you want us to stand, to not betray you, to be on your side, to be in your grace. To not be like the heathens, to not be like the earth dwellers, but to be children of God as we are called. And more and more as the days grow closer or grow to an end, as things get closer and closer to that time, may we become more like that, become more washed, more cleansed, so that we show, we appear like you're showing us as a chaste virgin without spot or wrinkle. May we become the people you're making us to be, but may we do it sooner than later. May we become more like that now versus at the last minute. Because it is to your glory that we act this way, that we conduct ourselves this way, not only towards you, but towards everyone else around us, towards in this life, this everyday life. May you be glorified in all your people. May you be praised by all your people. And may you be worshipped in truth and in spirit from all your people. Because you are worthy 
of all of these things and so many more. You are worthy of our love, worthy of our affection. And may our love and affection be true for your glory and in your name. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for evening devotion. I'm not trying to lay a burden on anybody and to make some make somebody get become so overwhelmed that they might question. Go to the Lord. Ask him about these things. You have this open mic with him at all times. Go to him and ask him. Say, Lord, just show me what he's talking about. Go to the scriptures, look it up, and you'll see for yourself. And what, it, what it'll do is when you learn to identify this, learn to see this, what it'll do, it causes a great peace to fall over you because you realize, I don't have to be like that. I don't have to be like the rest of the world. I don't have to act like them. I can exclude myself from those things and still live in this world. And you can be very blunt and very upfront with people when they say, well, why can't you just be like everybody else? Because I'm not like everybody else. That's not the right way to do things. I'm going to do things the right way. You don't like it? Fine. But I'm an adult. I make my own decisions. That's become one of my catchphrases. And somebody says, well, you shouldn't be doing that. Well, I'm an adult. I can make my own decisions, first of all, just like everybody else can. But I'm learning what the right thing is to do, and that's what I'm going to do. To glorify my Lord in everything I can as I live this life. While I'm still here. So that I don't betray the Son of God with a kiss. So that I don't betray my own faith. So that I don't turn away from what I claim to be and go back to the world and act the way the world does. Look at look at look at the church today, the worldwide church. Look at how people are abandoning the faith. How people are turning on each other. It's exactly like the Lord said it was going to be. Right before the end. And here we are. Amazing. So Examine yourself. There's nothing scary about it. Look, and if you find something there that's that's amiss, take it to the Lord. Go immediately into prayer and ask the Lord, Lord, what do I do? What do we do? How do I how do we fix it? I need to change this. I need you to change this and make me be the way you want me to be, what you're turning me into. That I may glorify you in everything I do. And that comes from a deep seated love for Christ. Because if that's present, we would never betray him with a kiss. We would never fake or feign our love to him. And if we won't do it to him, then we won't do it to those around us. We will genuinely love those around us. And that will be very foreign to them. I speak from experience. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. It's going to freak people out. Do it anyway. Because it just may be there's somebody out there that needs to hear those words of admonishment, needs to hear those words of rebuke, needs to hear the truth in the purest, roughest form possible, because it may just be that changes everything for them. And they realize, you know what? I've been walking the wrong path. I don't like what they said, and I don't like the way they said it, but what they said was true. And everything changes for them. Everything is different. And a brand new future opens up. And just maybe those seeds of faith will sprout and they will become saved. And then we get to take them to heaven with us. We all get to go together. It's a beautiful thing. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.